Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us back. We are here with George Kaiser and Joe Sandry in the Spectrum Management and Human RF Exposure Panel. I'll be introducing both of them and then they will take it away and share their thoughts and then we'll be doing questions at the end. So George Kaiser is the president at Television Inc, where he consults in telecommunication systems with a main focus on fixed point-to-point -point microwave radios and associated network management systems. He authored Digital Microwave Communication, Microwave Communication, and contributed to chapter two, chap contributed a chapter in volume two of the handbook of microwave te technology. He was also the author of several peer-reviewed technical articles. So George, thanks for being here with us today. And we also have Joe Sandry. Joe is the CEO and founder of Thought Delivery Systems. He has been an officer of multiple publicly traded companies. He most recently was the co-president of Fiber Tower Corporation, which sold to AT&T in 2018. He serves on several boards of communications and environmental technology sectors, and he is currently the NSMA president. Prior to his executive experiences, he served in private practice for a Washington, D.C. based law firm, representing numerous Fortune 100 companies in technology matters. He is also operating officer of the Balance Group. So thank you, George and Joe. Um, and we look forward to your presentation and I will be fielding questions from the group. If I remember correctly, Joe was also a sports announcer. <laughs> <laughs> Joe has, has worn many hats in his past. He has indeed. I've come to find. <laughs> so George, I think you're up first. If okay, you're all right. Well, let me share my screen. And let's get started with that. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, today I'd like to talk about uh, radio frequency exposure limits. Now, everybody who is responsible for an FCC authorized transmitter in the United States needs to put this date on their calendar, May 3rd next year. If you don't know why you need to put that on the calendar, you're lucky because today's presentation will explain that to you. Now, for the last zillion years, uh, fixed point-to-point -point, uh, microwave, at least part 101 microwave, it has been exempt from exposure limitation uh, evaluations that uh, we've never had to do RF evaluations, although sometimes zoning commissions require us to, but uh, legally to be authorized by the FCC, that's never been an issue. However, in 2019, the commission published a new uh, memor memorandum, which told us that we were going to see changes in the criteria for determining when a licensee was exempt from RF exposure evaluation. Those rules went into effect uh, May of last year. What the rule said was compliance would be applicable to all facilities and all transmitters regulated by the FCC, and that's whether they're licensed or unlicensed. That's also an interesting new twist to the situation. And the, the, uh, these rules, will go into effect and become applicable uh, on May, May 3rd, 2001, which of course was last this, this time last year. And then uh, uh, those rules required all licensees to make an evaluation of their transmitters. The evaluation requires you to be in compliance with these new rules in one of two ways. You either qualify as an exempt uh, RF source. If you don't qualify as exempt, then you have to do an evaluation. You can be considered exempt if your, your transmit source ERP is less than 19.2 times the distance between that trans, that uh, RF source and the closest possible person, that distance uh, uh, squared. 
Now, this is interesting because the commission is showing their their lack of understanding of uh, of uh, aperture antennas that we work with here at uh, in the in the part 101 frequency bands. They're saying that if your ERP is not greater than this value, uh, you're you're exempt. However, the point, as we'll see later, it, the issue here is that for aperture antennas, the lower the ERP, the worse the R potential RF hazard. But the commission doesn't recognize that. Uh, so moving on, uh, these, these are the rules. Now here's how you, uh, the top formula is how you uh, calculate EIRP, which is what we typically do in the in the point to point community. We we can uh, determine EIRP, and uh, that's you, that's very handy because we use it on our path calculations. But basically, basically, it's the transmit power at the antenna and dBm plus antenna gain as uh, relative to an isotropic source. And you can go through these formulas and grind through those. And the next to the last uh, formula on the on the bottom is the uh, is the equation that you need to determine ERP as the commission wants you to use it for your evaluation. I think most of us are familiar with these with these formulas. If the facility does not meet that uh, exemption criteria, then within two years of the rules, May 3rd, 2021, you have to do an evaluation of that RF source. And of course, there is a source of the May 3rd, 2022 date that I put at the beginning of the presentation. So what do you do if your facility is not exempt? Well, first of all, let's not get too excited here. Most of our uh, transmitters are putting out no more than a, a, a few watts, maybe three or four watts maximum if you have several transmitters on that antenna, but typically it's uh, well below four watts. A Christmas tree light bulb typically, will, if it's uh, incandescent, will put out about seven watts of electromagnetic radiation. Now, there may be a war on Christmas, but there's certainly not a war on Christmas tree lights. So I don't think we have people running around screaming that uh, Christmas tree lights are going to cause you to get two heads or cause the, your, your kids to be deformed or anything like that. And yet Christmas tree lights put out far more energy, electromagnetic energy, typically in the infrared spectrum, than do our microwave radios. So I think we're getting a little excited if we really think that there's a there's an issue with RF radiation from our microwave antennas, but uh, but we can evaluate that. We typically are dealing with two types of antennas, either circular antennas, the so-called parabolic antennas that we deal with in the Part 101 licensed environment, or we're dealing with square antennas, typically the ones used in the Part 15 unlicensed environment. But both of those types of transmitters have to be evaluated based on the new FCC rules. Now, what we're not interested in is the energy far away from the antenna. The FCC is focused on ERP or EIRP, uh, which is basically a far field phenomena. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the near field energy, the energy that's directly in front of the, R, the radiation source that's very, of course, very, very near to that source. That's what we're concerned about is the energy very close to the antenna. If you calculate the energy of in front of the antenna, you will see that by far the bulk of that energy is directly in front basically boresight on that antenna. As you go off boresight, uh, the energy falls off very quickly. So we're interested in calculating what is the worst case energy directly in front of that antenna. And that's true for circular or square antennas. The limits that the FCC uh, as required for us are in two of two types. One is for uncontrolled exposure, and that's just for exposure that the casual person would have if they walked in front of the RF source. And then there are the controlled exposure, controlled areas where the uh, RF energy may be higher, but, uh, but the people are aware of the higher RF energy and can, and can take uh, precautions to protect themselves. 
For the general population, the uncontrolled exposure limit is one milliwatt per square centimeter. For controlled areas, it's five milliwatts per square centimeter. But most of the time, we're trying to make sure that we're in compliance with that uncontrolled limit of one milliwatt per square centimeter. Now, there has been some, uh, uh, some discussion recently on whether that is the correct value to use for, for evaluation of, of uh, safety near uncontrolled areas, but I will point out that this value has been in a, around for a long time universally across the globe. The United States, Canada, and Europe all use the one milliwatt and five milliwatt uh, limits for uncontrolled and controlled area exposure. Uh, in the frequency range that we're dealing with. So this is not something that the, uh, the FCC just dreamed up uh, on their own. It's a, it's a common limit around the world. Now the uh, uncontrolled exposure is the exposure that could, could occur for a person who is not aware of the exposure or cannot ex exercise control over their exposure. Controlled exposure limits are in areas that where the person who is being exposed is fully aware of the potential for exposure and can exercise control over their exposure. Depending on the, the area in front of the RF source, you are obligated to put signage to explain to people what's going on in front of that source. These are the typical signs that would be used depending on the area that you're in. And I'll, I'll point out that these are color coded and I will talk about that in a moment. If you're below the limit, below the exposure limit of, uh, of the uncontrolled area or the general population limit, then you're really not obligated to put any, anything out there. You can put some informational signs if you like, but there's no legal requirement to do that. If you exceed the general population limit, you're obligated to put some signage. If you're between the, the general population limit and the occupational limit or the uncontrolled and controlled limits, then you're obligated to put uh, a notice uh, basically the blue sign that I had on the previous slide. If you exceed the, uh, the controlled area limit, you are obligated to put either a, a caution or warning sign, depending on how much, uh, how much uh, energy you're, you're putting in that area. So depending on your RF, uh, depending on the RF exposure of the individual, you, uh, your signage will, will be different. Now, how do you determine whether or not you're at, in compliance with those, with those rules? I've written a paper on this and explained how you determine that. Uh, the, the name of the paper is down there at the bottom, Estimating RF Near Field Power, February 25, 2021. And I'm making that available in SMA. They can put that on the website. So you can pull that down and read that at, at your leisure. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that. But if you want the, uh, the Cliff Notes version, the simplified version, here's the chart that you would use. You've got a chart for, for parabolic antennas, you've got a chart for square antennas. The, uh, you look at the diameter of the parabolic antenna on the column to the left, you figure out your diameter and you read off the the maximum power on the center column, and that if your power delivered to that antenna is less than that value, uh, you're in compliance and, and you can drive on. If uh, you're working with square antennas, you do the same thing, except you're looking at width, not, uh, not diameter. And you'll notice that the values there are considerably higher for a given size. But I would point out a couple of interesting features about this chart. As the antenna gets smaller and smaller, the intensity of, of the RF in front of that antenna goes up and your power, your maximum allowed, allowable power goes down. So for those big antennas that people seem to get so excited about, you have very, uh, very lenient uh, maximum power requirements. However, for, for the very small antennas, typically the ones that are used in an unlicensed environment, you have relatively, uh, relatively strict power limits. 
Now, keep in mind, if you fail to, uh, to meet the power limits on this chart, you can add 7 dB to them and be uh, dealing with a controlled, limit, controlled area limit. But of course, that will require you to, uh, do, you to add some signings. You will be required if you're in a controlled. If you exceed the general population or uncontrolled limit, you're obligated to put up some signings and you have to start. There are other requirements if you read the rules and including you have to control the area, you know, put a fence around it or do something to control people from just wandering into that area. So hopefully you will be able to uh, to meet the limits of the uh, uncontrolled area and and you'll have no no signage requirements and no control control area requirements. Now, by the way, a lot of people use Bulletin 65 uh, to do their calculations to see if they're meeting the FCC rules. Uh, there are some issues with that. First of all, it's wrong. And secondly, Bulletin 65 only includes circular antennas. It doesn't include square antennas. The uh, Bulletin 65 equation is uh, equations for calculating power density are interesting because they are they are uh, contrary to physics. Uh, the Bulletin 65 equation says that the power density goes down as the antenna efficiency goes down. Well, that's not the way aperture antennas work. As the aperture antenna efficiency goes down, more and more energy is, is placed at the center of the antenna, which means as the efficiency goes down, the intensity of RF radiation actually goes up. So the FCC has it backwards. And of course, the FCC doesn't give you the square antenna case. But fortunately for you, you're, you're listening to the presentation today. So you have the answers already. You have both the parabolic, the correct parabolic and uh, square antenna cases. So in conclusion, Put May 3rd, 2023 on your calendar if you're responsible for any FCC authorized transmitters because you gotta have some work done between now and then to either show that you're exempt or show that your transmitters uh, uh, meet the FCC rules. The end. Thank you, George. And Joe, I believe you have some um, slides to present as well. We don't have any questions yet. So if we want to, Joe, if you want to go ahead and present and then we can do questions at the end. That's great. Um, are you, you want me to share a screen or are you going to share a screen? If you want to share, if not, I can pull up your slides if you give me a minute. All right. Let me, uh, let me see if I can uh, do the, uh, actually, if you do it, that would be awesome. Okay. Give me one second. While we're waiting on that, George is always crisp and professional and provides good intel. Uh, I appreciate that, especially with the square antenna issue in particular, folks haven't really uh, had a chance to look at that. You know, one thing might be useful to advocate for obviously is an update in the circular 65 is, 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 a, is a, a, a prime concern. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm afraid the FCC really doesn't understand aperture antennas, but uh, yeah, yeah. we'll ignore that for the moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. So uh, to fill the gaps, what, what you heard from George was, you know, what's going on in the current state of play in terms of the published regulations? Um, and then what I try to do is fill in the gap about what has happened in the last year in particular, uh, but but, but writ large in terms of challenges to the existing published regulations uh, that are out there. Uh, what kind of traction do they have? What is their basis? And are they successful or not? And what does that mean for us? Uh, and what does that mean for society at large? Um, so uh, next slide, please. So, you know, big picture, there's, there have been quite a few developments, both in the legal and regulatory space, uh, federal courts, federal agencies, also in measurement techniques, uh, the measurement techniques are driven by what uh, perceived demand in the market for more data. Uh, as George mentioned, you know, uh, the, you know, MBC, you know the, uh, the, the circular 65 and other uh, rules haven't really, they've been static. Um, and they measure a very specific notion that the FCC has calibrated everything to. And that's why the rules have remained static. Um, now there's pressure on that. There's pressure for other types of measurements. Uh, coming from other countries, coming from uh, folks in academia, 
coming from folks in different sectors of the economy and different uh, citizen groups as well. So I'll try to explain some of that um, writ large, uh, but I'll throw out a few notions. One is, you know, making sure all the bandwidth is measured, for example, on a rooftop, uh, because the FCC requires if somebody does exceed that, that folks who contribute 5% or more need to be uh, part of the, the mitigation in the event there's a need for mitigation. Uh, measuring both sides of a link. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I'll introduce the concept that this thing is the other side of a link often. And on rooftops and now with base stations close to the ground on street furniture, is that is the is is are both sides of the link being measured uh, in the in the approximate zone? Um, and uh, then there's other aspects of specific absorption rate and something called crest factor and other uh, other elements that are being introduced. And there are also now persistent devices that are, are being marketed and deployed at, in, in great volume that are permanently placed on rooftops, for example. I'll talk a little bit about them and talk a little bit about some of the claims mostly coming out of ac academia on uh, human and uh, flora and fauna. Uh, writ large, is a, it, from an engineering standpoint, what they're discussing is that humans and flora and fauna, anything that's alive is an electrical device, just like uh, the radios that we calibrate to. And uh, if it's alive, it's, it's emitting uh, on a certain channels. And what does that mean uh, for us? Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit at the very tail end of this. Next slide, please. So in the last year, since our last annual meeting, there was a federal court case heard and the FCC's rules were remanded. And these are the rules that George is talking about. Now, if on remand, the commission doesn't change their rules, if they just come up with further uh, backup for why the rules are the way they are, then we still calibrate to, to May 3rd, 2023. If they change the rules, then we're going to start calibrating to the unknown, whatever that unknown is. Uh, but it's, it's important to understand some of the reasoning that the court utilized. So the case is Environmental Health Trust at all versus FCC. It was decided on August 13th of 2021. And the, the money quote was, the commission failed to provide a reasoned explanation for its determination that its guidelines adequately protect against uh, the harmful effects of exposure to radio frequency ra radiation unrelated to cancer. Um, and then it went into a, a three-part study. And it's basically said that the commission must, in particular, you know, one, provide a reasoned explanation for its decision uh, uh, to retain its current testing procedures uh, for determining whether cell phones or other portable electronic devices comply with its guidelines. Uh, and then it must also address the impacts of RF radiation on children, uh, the health impl implications of long-term exposure to RF radiation, the ubiquity of, of wireless devices and other technological developments that have occurred since the commission last updated its guidelines. And three, address the impacts of RF radiation on the environment. And they, they, they note, to be clear, we take no position in the scientific debate regarding the health and environmental effects of RF radiation. We merely conclude that the commission's cursory analysis of the material record uh, evidence was insufficient as a matter of law. So it doesn't mean that they agree or disagree with what's being argued out there in the, in the public square, but the court is basically saying they need a uh, uh, much more than they, they need, the commission needs to do a, a detailed dive into the material record. Next slide, please. So another part of that case, Environmental Health Trust versus the FCC, is that the FCC it, it has relied upon the Food and Drug Administration, uh, which was directly implicated in the case. Uh, the FCC's position on its standards is that they don't need to be re re revised because they, they, they came from a, a healthcare agency's recommendation. However, the FDA's process was called into question by the court. The FDA uh, recommendation that uh, the FC has been relying on for quite a long time appears to not have been derived from an Administrative Procedures Act compliant process. Um, uh, in, in, in layman's terms, there was a letter written by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Shuren to Julius Janikowski, the former head of Office of Engineering Technology. And the court is asking, well, what was the basis for that letter? Where's your rulemaking? Where's your peer-reviewed studies? Where's, where's your process, FDA? Um, 
And so uh, as a downstream impact from the court ruling, the FDA and its parent agency, uh, eight, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, have now been petitioned. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, full disclosure, I'm it, through the balance group, I'm, I'm involved in that, that part of that, uh, asking for where's, you know, show us the science, so we can we can measure it. Um, uh, on December 21st, the petition was filed. And, you know, it's known as a citizen's petition for imminent hazard ruling. So the question is, either one, FDA, can you show an ADA compliant rulemaking process by which you derive your standard that you gave the commission, by which the commission relied upon, by which George and the rest of all of us are relying on as, as the, the standard. And if you can't show the process, uh, are you going to declare an intimate hazard and, 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 and immediately begin a rulemaking process so that everyone can have stability in the industry and, and as customers and in the environment? So we all know this is all based on the, an edifice that has been well-reasoned through the processes required by U.S. law. Um, so there's more details here, but uh, since that filing has been made, there's over 800 comments and counting at the FDA, uh, putting data into its record as well. Next slide, please. Uh, also, in terms of federal court cases, there was a uh, hearing on December 3rd of 2021 when it came to satellite mega constellations. The, uh, the balance group and uh, Viasat had both filed at the FCC uh, request that the FCC study more thoroughly uh, the impacts on humans and on the environment uh, when it comes to these mega constellations. When Sputnik was launched in 1957, up until those filings were made uh, a year or two ago, about 10,000 satellites had been launched in the history of mankind. Uh, what the FCC has uh, approved are net, you know, networks, mega constellation networks that are much closer to Earth than the large body of satellites out there. Uh, two, uh, we're talking about 40,000 satellites approved for, for networks during their lifespan in multiple 40,000 satellite networks. And so the request was made, well, since these are by far the largest networks in the history of mankind, will there be impact studies made, environmental impact studies and other impact studies? The commission rejected those requests. Those requests were then taken to court on December 3rd, oral argument was heard. Uh, the ruling is still yet to be decided. Um, a few things to know about that. One is, while that ruling is pending, the FCC is, has been taking comments on a generation two set of networks, mega constellation networks. Uh, one, the mega constellation networks already approved and the ones that are under consideration also have on the ground transceivers. Anything from traditional earth station, uh, base stations that we're, many of us are familiar with, to uh, there's quite a few publications out there uh, and, and proposals around using these ultimately as the earth station satellite uh, to uh, smartphone communication. And that's the purpose of some of these networks. So that then implicates a lot of the human RF exposure uh, issues even, even more so. Um, the generation two proposal comments were due on February 8th. Uh, the next day on February 9th, 40 to 49 of SpaceX's satellites, uh, I, I think one calculation was that it was about 15% of the ones they'd already launched, were knocked out of orbit by a, a, a generic solar storm. And so uh, the court asked, you know, FCC, are you in a ready fire aim posture here where these networks aren't being uh, given due testing uh, prior to, you know, fully opening the portals to large scale deployment? And you know, this was on the cover of New York Times and everything else about these satellites being knocked out of orbit. If all the satellites had been launched, for example, in, a, in some of these large scale mega constellation networks, you would have seen thousands of satellites knocked out of orbit. And what does that mean? Uh, both for communications, for national security, for reliance uh, of our economy on, on those networks in the event we end up relying wholly on them, as well as the human R for exposure and other issues uh, that are the subject of this this particular uh, panel. Uh, next slide, please. Now there's, in addition to those issues on the books, uh, there's other uh, regulations on the books that are little discussed, uh, but are becoming more and more into focus. One is the EPA has regulations on the books and has had for decades 
uh, the fact that it regulates RF radiation as an air pollutant. And there are more and more uh, uh, eyes drawn to, to that set of regulations and they may become more and more implicated. Similarly, the FDA has on the books uh, regulations where it regulates RF radiation as an ingredient. So again, that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the FDA petition noted a moment ago and other, uh, other uh, filings is, is coming more and more into focus. Uh, on May 12th of this month, uh, just you know, last week, the National Council on Disability conducted a meeting pursuant to federal, uh, the Federal Register where on their agenda, they had human RF exposure issues listed. Uh, the National Institutes of Health has a uh, series of studies, in particular a, a study regarding humanized uh, mice and rats and them purportedly being more subject to cancer. Uh, the Naval Medical Research Laboratory had some studies some years back, and uh, very recently the Army and the U.S. Air Force have put out a request for proposal for uh, wearable devices to, to detect directed energy weapons, which is different than what we're talking about, except in one aspect is that in the same, uh, and there's a citation here to the IEEE Microwave Theory and Techniques Society magazine for April of 2022, where it talks about the Army and the Air Force seeking uh, the wearable device uh, RF uh, monitors. Uh, in the same uh, magazine, there were a series of articles, including by Dr. Jeremy Lin, talking about how these directed energy weapons often operate below the FCC's threshold for safe RF emissions. So of course, how these things are designed matters materially, right? Uh, our devices presumably are not uh, as lethal as directed energy weapons. Uh, and of course, as George aptly noted in, you know, Christmas lights or maybe even your refrigerator might be radiating less than a lot of our RF devices that we uh, 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 coordinate and manage in our profession. But that doesn't mean that that's not gonna be lost in the fog of this, this discussion that's continued to escalate. Um, the World Health Organization has cited RF radiation as possibly carcinogenic. And there was a case uh, where the uh, town of Pittsfield, Massachusetts effectively blocked Verizon's uh, deployments there recently, and this uh, month, Verizon sued uh, in federal court, uh, asking for declaratory judgment from the US District Court in, in, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, you know, asking uh, against the city and its Board of Health, saying that, hey, the FCC manages health issues, not uh, boards of health in cities like Pittsfield. So this is, again, uh, another area of, of uh, contention over these issues. Next slide, please. Now, this gives rise to, well, if there's going to be a lot of finger pointing and a lot of legal cases and a lot of federal agencies uh, all jumping into this, where's the smoke and where's the fire and where's the light? And of course, NSMA has unique abilities. Spectrum managers have unique abilities to discern where interference is coming from, where energy is coming from. And then the federal agencies and other uh, decision makers can decide what to do with that information. Um, and so that's a key area, whereas uh, there's many hundreds, if not thousands of devices people can buy on Amazon to purportedly measure human RF exposure, and uh, they can lead to people being misinformed, uh, given what we know in our industry about how to really understand where energy is coming from and at what levels and what modulations and what fits and what doesn't fit within the law. So uh, the, the, in, you know, the industry and the public, are, I think, are whether they know it or not, are crying out for some accuracy in information. Um, much like when you buy a new car, there's a sticker on the window that says the wheelbase is 108 and a half inches, and uh, the, the uh, horsepower is 187 or whatever. Uh, you don't question that. You know it's been aptly measured by professionals. And uh, it seems like we need that type of uh, truth and labeling through spectrum management techniques. Um, a couple of things to focus on going back to uh, full bandwidth. There's a lot of rooftop studies and tower studies where the folks who are going in and doing the measurements are using gear that's only uh, capable of measuring, let's say, below six gigahertz. There's a lot of studies in that uh, of that nature, and some of them were uh, cited in the FDA petition that was filed December 21st. 
So that, you know, especially when 5G involves millimeter wave bands uh, above six gigahertz up to 40 gigahertz, there should be protocols where the, uh, the bands above 60 gigahertz are being measured. Two, even the bands below 60 gigahertz are, is cal are calibrated antennas being used and our processes is being used uh, when it comes to really understanding interference. Three, are both sides of the link being measured? This is the other side now of a microwave device, given the antennas in, a, in an iPhone, for example. So if, for example, real life case in the FDA petition, there's a sun deck on the roof of a building, where, which is also houses uh, a dozen or so base stations. Some of the base stations are literally a foot from the, uh, where people sit uh, on the sun deck. Um, so if they're all on their phones, is that being measured and taken into account? One, are rooftop measurements being made? Two, are the rooftop measurements being made that cover from below one gigahertz up to 40 gigahertz? Uh, are those measurements occurring with calibrated antennas? And are the uh, real life measurements of having phones in the space during the measurement period being taken into account? But likewise, is the specific absorption rate, this device also has its own SAR rating. Uh, what does that mean if this device is next, is a foot away from a base station or an array of base stations? All that's not really being measured right now. And all that is clearly being uh, put to the test in these cases that were cited earlier in this presentation. Therefore, it makes sense to have professionals, not a lot of folks running around with uh, maybe a $99 device off of Amazon making claims. So uh, again, the need for spectrum managers seems to be coming to the forefront uh, in the event as expected, uh, these types of issues come uh, forward. We should uh, ideally be prepared as an industry for that. Um, there's also other elements. There's something called a crest factor which um, uh, a lot of uh, the folks on this um, uh, member, you know, in terms of our membership, a lot of our, a lot of our members know about that, Crest Factor. Um, and what that really means is uh, there's uh, usually millions, if not billions of surges, essentially, per second uh, above the FCC standard in many cases. Now, they're smoothed out by averaging, However, a lot of folks in the medical community and in the environmental community uh, have detailed papers showing that you know, they want to know if, how far it's going above the FCC standard for those millions or billions of times a second. And, what is, and it also, is that, has the FCC contemplated that uh, in terms of stating somebody or somebody is or is not complying with the, with the threshold? Um, um, so those are some other techniques. There's another technique as well. There's some, as I mentioned earlier, some, there's persistent RF uh, 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 sensing systems, both that have video so they can look at signage, is signage up, are barriers, have they been moved by a, a personnel who are working on the air conditioning unit? Uh, and as well, they can also sniff out if additional uh, base stations or other devices have been deployed in the roof since the last more detailed uh, RF analyzing uh, human RF exposure test has been made or site survey has been made. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, I'm going to go through a bunch of slides real quick. Uh, this is just the Environmental Health Trust case. Next slide. This is a case uh, in the U.S. District Court for Northern District of California regarding a case against Apple, uh, a class action case. Uh, it came uh, right around the time the Chicago Tribune published a bunch of articles saying they'd hired an FCC lab to test the mobile phones. And they purported to state that some of the uh, phones did not comply with the guidelines and standards that the phone, uh, the phone manufacturer stated in terms of often uh, you're told uh, if you look deeply into the, the, the phones, uh, um, P, a PDF on your phone or in, online uh, uh, regarding your phone model, often uh, you're told at, that to keep the phone at least five millimeters from your body, in some cases up to 14 millimeters. And uh, the Tribune article and this case purport to say that that should have even been further and there's other issues related. And of course, if you take the phone and put it next to a base station on a sun deck, what does that mean is the next question. That's not, a, I don't believe is entirely in that case, but uh, probably will be uh, litigated soon. Next slide. Um, and this is a, a one of uh, sometime from time to time the, the enforcement bureau uh, 
issues uh, orders related to compliance with human over exposure. Uh, so this this case uh, is is one of many in that uh, that have been contemplated in that area. Next slide. There are shielding designs out there that are more and more being utilized. This is one in the medical community. Uh, but uh, next slide, please. There's a variety of others uh, that are out there uh, when it comes to clothing and other devices. This is Dr. Zori Glazer, a PhD, uh, uh, who uh, published a lot of material on the health effects from RF and microwave. Uh, he's part of the U.S. Uh, uh, Naval uh, Medical Research Center, and his studies in the non-ionizing radiation exposure uh, focus mostly on adverse effects on military personnel, and uh, they led to the development of an RF effects laboratory. Now, of course, military personnel, if you're a pilot, or you're in a war zone and you're on high uh, intensity radar and enemy radar and uh, now directed energy weapons and other things, that's a way different environment than when you're uh, trying to get an ice cream cone at the local ice cream stand. But uh, be that as it may, there's a lot of information there that's uh, of interest to, to the community to understand what the parameters and, and what some of the bookends are. Next slide, please. Uh, the EPA itself has confirmed that there's a lack of wireless and 5G safety regulations for the birds, the bees, and the trees, so to speak. Uh, and th that goes back to the FDA uh, having the authority and on the books for quite a while to regulate RF as pollution. So uh, look out for more information around and, and activity around that area. Next slide. Uh, at, same way, there's a series of academics and others who are looking at the electrical signals in plants and in, in the greenhouses and in uh, food production. And what is what do those electrical signals mean when they're around high ten, you know, high density telecommunications networks? Uh, next slide. Uh, there's uh, another aspect to all this is insurance underwriters uh, uh, reportedly are not underwriting. Uh, the mobile phone industry for uh, for insurance coverage against human RF exposure or environmental RF exposure harms. So that's another key area. You know, why is that not being underwritten? What do the insurance uh, actuaries know? Uh, why are they making that decision? That's something that the public should know as well. Why that decision is has been made, and regulators probably should know that. And again. Uh, how are they coming about those decisions and how are they measuring that? Uh, again, uh, spectrum managers could provide a lot of light as to what that, those types of uh, measurements uh, that have occurred that made those decisions and what types of measurements are needed in the future to more uh, understand uh, the exponentially increasing amount of wireless networks out there and their role when it comes to being insured or not insured. Next slide. Thank you. Um, uh, this goes more to uh, apparently even weak radio frequency exposure in certain calibrations, in certain modulations, has uh, certain impacts on certain plants, according to this peer-reviewed study. Next slide. Um, same thing with bees. This happens to be a uh, uh, former head of uh, uh, the experimental dermatology unit at the Department of Neuroscience uh, in uh, uh, a key institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And he's a former adjunct professor for the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm as well. Um, so there's a lot of, again, a lot of this is coming out. And again, as spectrum managers, how do we think about this? And I think there's a way to apply known, you know, uh, solid spectrum management techniques for assessing how they're coming about, uh, you know, stating that it's RF that's causing the harms to bees versus pesticides or whatever else. You know, we, we, we want to understand the environment with which these tests are occurring, uh, for example. Next slide, please. Um, ambient radiation levels. Uh, there's a lot of studies about you know, unprecedented ambient radiation levels purportedly. Again, I haven't looked at this study uh, in depth, uh, but, uh, you know, there, these studies are coming out and how would spectrum managers look at these studies and think about them? Next slide, please. There's also a series of statements that children are purportedly uniquely vulnerable 
due to multiple factors. Uh, the brain of children uh, reportedly or purportedly can absorb twice the radiation of an adult, uh, bone marrow uh, likely as well. Um, and uh, you know, children are still developing. So there's a lot of statements being made by the medical community and others. You know, the, the skin on children is thinner than our skin. The skulls are thinner, smaller. So uh, therefore radiation permeates more uh, effectively. Uh, are the statements. And again, you know, these types of measurements, you know, do need serious spectrum management assessment. Next, next slide, please. Uh, this is a um, little bit dated, but an interesting chart about the amount of radiation from most to least emitting from different models of phones. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the five-year-old, 10-year-old and adult brain next to a cell phone. Uh, and, a, and a radiation absorption map. Next slide, please. Again, this has to do again with the children. Uh, next slide, please. Now there's a, other studies regarding sub emissions on the human body when it comes to our skin, our largest organ, and how our skin absorbs through our sweat ducts and other, other matters. There's a whole line of uh, professionals we're studying this at length as well. Again, uh, when they're doing these studies, have they employed professional spectrum management techniques? And, 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 uh, and, and if so, how so? Uh, um, what I've been seeing is a lot of very interesting studies, but I haven't seen a uniform process for assessing the source of the radiation. Is it realistic in the real world? Uh, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. This is one of the clothing brands out there that purport to protect against mobile phone radiation. Uh, the chart earlier that showed the phones that emit the most or least radiation purportedly, uh, all phones do have a recommended uh, uh, set of millimeters, five or more typically, to keep your phone, if it's on, away from your body. And therefore, if you have tight jeans on or whatever, you know, Phones are meant to be used by humans. So if you're supposed to keep them from your body, what does that all mean? And so obviously the industry is showing up with clothing that purportedly is going to protect. Again, how that's been measured, uh, you know, have they used professional spectrum management techniques? Again, you know, these are the, some of the questions. Next slide, please. Um, if we can keep going through a few more slides. Uh, thank you. Thank you. A few more. Uh, one more. Uh, so this is, uh, if you go back, just one. So uh, there's a quote from Dante about, uh, it's in Latin, I'm not going to read the Latin, but, you know, it's basically saying creation was handled, handed to man to nurture and protect, and not merely to, to, to pillage for temporal gain in our time here is short. And right at its dawn, God set the boundaries of day and night for man's good, his rediscovery and return to prelapsarian reality. Well, whatever all that means, but there's a series of articles out there that are saying, hey, are we rushing into RF deployment too intensely without doing the measurements? So this is out there in the, in the ether. And, uh, you know, these are serious questions. And again, they're going to, they're, these questions are not going to uh, cease. So again, it, it, I think it's quite uh, meaningful if we can get spectrum managers on the parapet, really doing the measurements to help understand where things are going. Next slide, please. So, in, you know, in conclusion, you know, events are accelerating. More and more sophistication is occurring in terms of the types of measurements that are are needed and are are, are happening. Um, and then there's uh, claims are compounding, you know, about what the impacts are. And often those claims aren't tethered to professional spectrum management measurements. Uh, next slide, please. So again, spectrum managers are in short supply, high demand. Spectrum managers are key to providing proper measurements and techniques for assessing human environmental RF exposure. And uh, let's hope that more spectrum managers are being created and, and we're involved in helping with that creation. Uh, and last slide, thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mariana. Okay, thank you both. And we are coming up to the last few minutes before our next session, but there is um, one question in the chat. Has anyone, this is from Judith Shapiro. 
has anyone considered asking for a waiver of part 101 RF evaluations on the ground that they don't serve any useful purpose? Maybe this will be as spirited a conversation as our last panel on satellite mega constellations was. <laughs> You want to take that, George? Uh, nobody there, to my knowledge, no. There's been no one that has uh, has proposed that to the commission. But the uh, the rules are beyond, you know, part 101. The 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 RF rules are in part one, which it covers for all R all RF, not not just part 101 RF. The the FCC exposure limits are. Uh, go across all uh, all FCC managed uh, transmitting sources. So, so you know, to my oh, knowledge- from Mitchell Lazarus, sorry, I misspoke. That was, I think he's logged into his wife's account, but that question was from Mitchell Lazarus. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> well, George. Personally, I don't, uh, given the power levels that we're dealing with, with part 101, I can't, can't believe that the, uh, the current uh, law provides any any utility except perhaps gets uh, gets lawyers a little a uh, little more uh, billable hours to do the calculations or the engineers bill billable hours for consultants to do the calculations but you know I think it's pretty obvious that with regard to part 101 point to point services they don't serve the, the current the new version of the rules uh, don't serve any useful purpose but to my knowledge, nobody has has attacked that legally. But we've we've had RF, um, we've had point to point microwave systems since the 1950s, and to my knowledge, we have no no documented cases of of harm from those. But uh, I'll leave that to the to the lawyers to to argue over. Yeah, and I'd only add one coda, which is with the uh, rules on remand uh, through the Environmental Health Trust versus FCC case, uh, DC Circuit ruling from August of last year. Uh, in theory, the FCC could uh, uh, answer that question for for Mitchell uh, and and in in some manner. So. Well, the new rules have uh, are obligating an awful lot of work. At uh, six gigahertz, we have 100,000 licensed transmitters. At 11 gigahertz, we probably got double that number. And then in the in the unlicensed bands, I have no idea how many transmitters we have, but a whole bunch. And this rule requires that an awful lot of work be uh, be done to to evaluate the the transmitters, since in most cases we don't know where the transmitters are located relative to the closest possible uh, 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 person's location, you're almost always going to have to do an evaluation because you simply don't know enough information to, to figure out what that R factor is. So, you know, you're talking about multiple hundreds of thousands of calculations that have got to be done over the next, next year. To me, that's a lot of wasted energy for no no conceivable purpose, but I'm, I don't get a vote on that. That's the law now. Well, it seems like we are at our time and we have our next session with Dr. David Morris on federal government and spectrum management needs. So we'll see everyone over there. George and Joe, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for all of your valuable insight. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Good George. to meet with you all again. Yes, this was great. And we'll see everyone in the next session in just a couple of minutes.